I judge a book by its cover once, and now I research why you shouldn't do it. It was late 2007, I just started university, and all I could think was, here are my adulthood years, I'm 18 years old now, I should own my life like all adults do, and read some nonfiction books. That's what adulting is, right? My degree was in French, so I went to this French bookstore on a Saturday morning, and of all the books, I was drawn into saint Exupéry's The Little Prince. I looked at the cover, amazed by how lightweight it was, and I slowly put it down and I thought, wow, why did they leave a children's book in the adult section? Such an adult comment to make. Six months later, The Little Prince was an assigned book in my French literature class. When I read it, aside from developing a long-lasting addiction to each sentence, I felt ashamed. I thought, if I hadn't been given this opportunity to read The Little Prince, I would have missed the most impactful story of my life. Now, years later, as a language scientist, I go after moments of snapshot judgments, such as judging a book by its cover. But instead of trying to understand how we judge books by their covers, I try to understand how we judge others' accents by their looks. Now, an accent is a paradoxical element in itself. It exists in all of us, but most of us do not want to have it. To say you have an accent is to acknowledge that a part of you is different than others. And in some ways, Acknowledging this can make you stand out in a crowd. And we are all social animals. We don't like to be left out. But I've been mostly interested in accents when they occur as a result of bilingualism, which is when you acquire a second language. For instance, if someone in Finland decides learning English as a second language, they might have some reminiscences of Finnish in their English. This is an organic feature of learning a second language, and it's nothing to be afraid of. And in fact, it shows the unique paths each and every one of us take. And thank goodness we sound slightly different than each other. It shows that we are humans and not machines. As a multilingual adult, I myself have my unique accent, and you're already hearing it. In fact, it's so unique that at the beginning of each semester, it leads to a class-long discussion. I often ask my students to guess where they think I'm from, and I receive some of the most charming place guesses. From Brazil to Japan, my all-time favorite is Mars. I learned English when I moved to Canada from Turkey in 2012. Before then, I was somewhat exposed to English, but I never experienced speaking it. My first years of using English were made up of sentences in a Yiddish way, but without the wiseness. And I, aside from the word order, I had difficulty pronouncing these TH sounds. And I still clearly remember one cold morning, even though all mornings are cold in Canada, I walk into pharmacy and I ask, what can I use for this huge blister on my thong? And you know, you never know what you did wrong when people start laughing and disapproving at the same time. Well, no matter what I do, no matter how embarrassing a mistake I make, I came to the conclusion that this is who I am. And when I reached this conclusion, I realized with the coldest truth. I was privileged enough to laugh at my accent and constantly make fun of it because I'm white. But in fact, my accent was found to be funny, charming, and even sophisticated. But an Indian English speaker's accent is found to be incomprehensible, unintelligible, and not sophisticated. And this is the part where I realized that the snapshot judgments that people had of me differed towards, that they had towards other people. And I didn't like it, because I didn't want to miss another impactful story of my life just because of our brain snapshot judgments. As a scientist, I, I had to do something about it, so I delved into bilingualism. And let me begin with this. Being a bilingual is awesome. A plethora of research shows that when you acquire a second language, your brain turns into a giant gym. All of a sudden, different parts of your brain start exercising. Research even shows that being a bilingual protects from neurodegenerative diseases such as the Alzheimer's disease. Learning a new language contributes to happy and healthy aging, which makes sense. Because the older we get, the smaller our social circles become, but with more languages, we have access to more individuals. If bilingualism is this awesome, why do we then stigmatize it so much by focusing on accents or judging people's accented speech? Well, the answer is in our brains. Our brains become experts of the information that we provide to them systematically. Once you acquire your first language, that language invades and shapes a lot of things in your brain. The fact that you can tell that I'm not a native speaker of English is because your brain knows what American English sounds sound like, and any little variation can be detected. 
And probably by now you have these loud alarms in your brain saying that he is not a native speaker, which is fine, I'm fine with that. But then the issue gets really complicated when our brains start hearing non-existing accents. In my dissertation research, I work on this illusion. I pair pictures of faces with American, British, and Indian English. Imagine seeing someone's face on a computer screen and listening to sentences. In one condition with a South Asian face, in another condition with a white face. In short, the only thing that was changing was the faces. Participants' task was to listen to those sentences, type them down, and judge if the speaker had an accent or not. Results show that when paired with a white face, it didn't matter much what type of variety they were listening to. They didn't have any difficulty typing down those sentences. But something strange happened when we switched faces from white faces to South Asian faces. All of a sudden, participants had really hard times typing down those sentences, and they even found American English as being accented. Faces impact how we hear others. We judge others by their covers. However, the most striking results show that participants who have more racial diversity in their social surroundings did not differ in terms of their judgments towards South Asian faces and white faces, which suggests that with more racial diversity in our social surroundings, we can actually not use those snapshot judgments. Now, these results have huge implications for a place like Florida, where a good portion of the population grow in multilingual houses. Can you imagine how we can judge someone by just looking at their face without listening to their voice? Would that future impact you, your loved ones? We're now living in a world where machines take over some parts of our lives by convenience. If you don't acknowledge our accents now, none of our accents will be acknowledged in the future. Imagine calling 911, a machine answers, and that machine cannot understand your speech because it was programmed by someone who assumed that accents are only funny things to laugh at in TV shows. In fact, during the times of health crisis and pandemics such as COVID-19, individuals who speak English as a second language have faced some of the harshest out uh, outcomes of these crises. What if your children apply for jobs or schools and their applications are disqualified by algorithms that cannot recognize their voices? What if your bank won't identify your voice? What if you try re-entering your home country from abroad and the automated custom service cannot understand your speech? In fact, some of these are already happening in a different platform. There was a recent incident where a face recognition program couldn't recognize people of color's faces because it was only programmed for white faces. Before it happens to our voices, let's make it count this time. What can we do about it? Well, first, let's not make fun of an accent. If somebody makes fun of an accent, let's raise our voices. Let's have children listen to people from more diverse backgrounds. Let's give our students more opportunities to interact with our international teaching assistants. Let's give our accents their, let's allow accents to live their lives in our lives. They're not going to harm our language. They're not going to change who we are. They should be allowed to stay with us on our unique paths. And let's not shy away from the reality. We all have accents. Some may be more similar than others, but they don't mean any harm. I would like to end on a personal note with a challenging story. You're looking at me right now, seeing a language scientist working on accents. Maybe you wouldn't see a struggling past, and maybe my face covers it all. But don't judge me by my cover. What if I told you you just finished listening to a trans person who is fortunate to be alive let alone to be on the stage. I struggled with my own voice for over 26 years. And now that I found it, it's my goal to help others to hold on to their voices. It might be hard for some to accept, but we can all exist in this world. The paradox begins when we question whether we can coexist at all. The reality is we've been coexisting for a very long time. We just don't want to give ourselves the credit. As a language scientist and someone with a struggling past, I can assure you that this is not hard at all. All we need to do is, instead of using words to describe our relationships, we experience our relationships. So next time, when you look someone in the face, instead of thinking about all the labels or words that you can use to describe them, think about all the endless opportunities that you can share with them. 
just like Saint Exupéry did with the Little Prince. Wow.